And it's about time we've discussed Venus once again. Mostly because of some of the recent discoveries that are actually kind of exciting and potentially solve some major mysteries on this beautiful, uh, somewhat hot and potentially somewhat deadly planet. And so, whole wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's discuss Venus once again. Let's talk about its atmosphere and the potential existence of life here, briefly discuss some of the future missions, and also talk about why it actually spins in such a weird way. And I guess maybe let's start with this, and this is once again based on one of the studies you can find in the description. And here the idea is to try to figure out why Venus rotates in the opposite direction to other planets. It has what's known as a retrograde spin. With a single rotation or a single spin, taking approximately 243 Earth days, which is basically slower than a single year, and so a day on Venus is technically longer than a year. But why this is so is still kind of debatable. There are of course several explanations, but none of them have enough evidence to confirm everything. For example, one of the explanations suggests that there was some kind of a major collision in the early formation of Venus, kind of similar to what happened on Uranus. And while Uranus basically flipped on its side because of that collision, Venus instead started to spin in a different direction. Likewise, maybe this is just a result of a gyroscope effect, where the spin axis basically flips when the object is not entirely symmetrical, this is something that we usually observe in zero-g conditions, and this is something that's known as Jenny Bakov effect that applies to spinning objects. But that of course also implies that sometimes Venus might spin back and might have done so many times in the past. Once again, no evidence for this either. And you can actually find this cool video in the description. Or another explanation actually relates to the thick atmosphere, the result of volcanism. Some research showed that basically because of very thick atmosphere, over time the rotation of the planet kind of stops because of the drag and can then even start spinning in the opposite direction if there is, for example, a lot of powerful wind activity as there is on Venus. And so maybe this is all just a result of a thick atmosphere. But the new proposition takes this a little bit further. Once again, no evidence yet, but a proposition that solves several problems. For example, why is there no moons around Venus? And so the answer is in this new study with the idea being relatively simple. Maybe in the early formation of the planet, there might have been some kind of an ancient moon that was potentially captured from elsewhere. But this moon, like many other objects in the early solar system, was not moving in the same direction and basically had retrograde motion. Or in other words, even though Venus was spinning normally, the moon was spinning in the opposite direction, which created a kind of a tidal drag, eventually forcing the planet to start changing its rotation as well. Now apparently because of the location of Venus relatively close to the Sun, capturing such a moon would not actually be that difficult. And so as the time passed, this potentially massive moon started to gravitationally pull on the planet and slowed it down over time. Here the scientists nicknamed this moon Neith. But because of the way it was orbiting the planet and because of the gravitational interactions, it would also slowly lose its orbit, basically coming closer and closer to Venus. At some point, very likely smashing into it, or into early Venus as it was forming in the first few hundred million years. Although in this case, it's actually quite likely that the moon itself would probably fall apart, turning into rings, which would then slowly smash into the planet's surface over a period of several thousand years, or possibly up to a million years. And all of this would have been relatively quickly and would unlikely change the planet in a lot of other ways other than changing its spin. And so in some sense, this explanation tackles two issues no moons around Venus and the strange rotation. And though the simulations here definitely make some sense, because there is no physical evidence, it's just going to remain another hypothesis, unless of course we find some evidence somewhere. For example, maybe there are certain rocks still orbiting Venus, representing some kind of a leftover of this ancient moon. Now that would definitely change everything. But because nothing like this has been seen yet, it's unlikely this explanation is going to go beyond just a cool proposition and just a hypothesis. But still a pretty cool paper and, I guess, a cool idea. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about something that might be proven at some point. Life on Venus. Does it exist or does it not? Well, despite initial hints of potential life on Venus, right now a lot of scientists are still quite skeptical. But this recent paper that is also somewhere right there does actually provide us with something really intriguing. Intriguing because it was believed to be impossible. And here we're talking about sulfuric acid. 
One of the main reasons a lot of scientists are skeptical about life here is because, well, there is just not a lot of water. We'll discuss why in a few minutes. And because there is not much water here, it's kind of difficult to explain the existence of life. But instead of water, in the atmosphere of Venus, there is plenty of sulfuric acid. As a matter of fact, to some extent, it kind of even acts like water, producing a lot of clouds and producing a lot of observations we see. And turns out, according to this new study, sulfuric acid is actually an intriguing medium for possibly some forms of life. But this is not just a proposition, this was an actual experiment. An experiment that used common amino acids, the stuff that we're basically made out of, combined with a simulated Venusian atmosphere in order to see what happens. And strangely enough, when the researchers conducted this experiment, out of 20 biogenic amino acids suspended in sulfuric acid, with all of this being done for approximately one month, they basically discovered that 19 of them remained almost untouched. And though some of them were chemically modified, they were still able to perform life-related chemistry. Although in this case, all of this was done in very similar temperatures and pressures to what we actually have on Earth. But on Venus, we know these conditions do exist at an altitude of about 50 to 60 kilometers. Here, the temperatures are about 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, and the pressure is very similar to what we have on Earth. And so the overall conclusion from the study is really simple. If these amino acids exist on Venus, for example, if they were delivered by some kind of an asteroid, they could easily start forming basic building blocks of life by using various materials and by essentially using sulfuric acid as the main medium. With some scientists believing that this is maybe already going on here based on a lot of different mysterious observations. Now, obviously there was that report of phosphine which is still kind of controversial and we still don't really know exactly what it is. The video in the description talks about this more. But a much more exciting discovery is from much, much earlier. The discovery of so-called UV absorbers. This was essentially an unusual discovery of relatively huge patches in the Venusian atmosphere that were absorbing very specific frequency of ultraviolet light with surprising efficiency capturing up to 50% of solar energy that even affected atmospheric structure and dynamics. And because there was no chemical explanation for what's actually happening here, for many, many years, a lot of scientists believed that maybe this was actually signs of life, potentially some kind of a bacterial life in the upper atmosphere, using UV light to conduct biological chemistry. And so the scientists behind this paper basically believe something similar. They think it's some kind of a sign of biological activity, extremely similar to what we usually find with terrestrial bacteria. But once again, just a proposition, just a hypothesis. For now. And here, let's talk about something entirely different that potentially disproves all of this. Tum tum tum. Let's talk about this other paper. A paper that examines something from a much more chemical perspective by once again using an intriguing experiment. And here the researchers approach this without any preconceptions, without any biases, but by just using pure chemistry. Mostly because we know that atmospheric composition here has a little bit of water, some chlorine, quite a lot of iron, and lots and lots of sulfuric acid. Which means that we can maybe perform certain chemical reactions to see what it forms. And so they start mixing materials, synthesizing a lot of different compounds that might exist in the atmosphere, based on what has been seen in the Venusian atmosphere, with their experiments resulting in a lot of different iron-bearing sulfate minerals, with two specific ones being really interesting, rhomboclase and an acid ferric sulfate, both very complex in their composition, but both potentially possible in the Venusian atmosphere. And turns out that when they used these two minerals and examined them under UV light, they surprisingly produced very similar observations or very similar absorption patterns to what's already been seen on Venus. And so by combining these two minerals in a specific phase, they were able to recreate these ultraviolet absorption patches. Later also explaining how all of this could form in the Venusian atmosphere through very specific reactions with sulfuric acid. And so for all we know, maybe this is indeed what's happening here and what was believed to be maybe life for a long time is just complex chemistry once again. But then there's also a question of water and things like carbon and oxygen. And we have a few more discoveries about this as well. One of them is actually from the Bepi Colombo mission we recently discussed, which is technically headed to Mercury, but is using Venus to slow down. And so during these recent passages, it was able to identify a few things about Venusian atmosphere 
that were once again somewhat surprising. Here, by flying through some parts of the induced magnetosphere produced by the solar wind around Venus, it was able to detect a few charged particles, which turned out to be carbon and oxygen, with both carbon and oxygen basically escaping as a result of solar activity and as a result of dissociation of molecules in the upper atmosphere of Venus. But it's really these carbon-oxygen groups that are kind of important to answer another question. So, what happened to Venusian water? Because it was always believed that Venus potentially had just as much water as planet Earth, and then somehow lost it. Now, we know that it very likely lost it at first because of super high greenhouse effect, which basically evaporated everything, but it should still have some water in the upper atmosphere. Yet even here it's just ultra dry, there's practically no water molecules visible anywhere. I mean, there are some, but much, much less than expected. And so by using additional computer simulations, combined with recent observations, the researchers might have solved that mystery as well. In the process of discovering that a lot of stuff in the upper atmosphere is actually a result of this dissociative recombination, which is basically caused by solar radiation breaking various molecules apart and then having them recombine into something different. With the results suggesting that a very specific molecule known as HCO+, or an ion of bicarbonate, made from hydrogen, carbon and oxygen, may be responsible for the loss of water. And that's because in the upper atmosphere, water mixes with carbon dioxide to form this unusual molecule pretty much at all times. And this is something that has already been discovered on Mars and is potentially the same reason Mars lacks water as well. But when this molecule becomes ionized, these individual ions don't survive for too long. They basically split in two, with hydrogen atoms escaping into outer space and the remnant carbon and oxygen basically escaping in a way that was just detected by Beppe Colombo. And so this study actually suggests that a lot of these unusual molecules are potentially all over the place in the upper atmosphere and they're responsible for making Venus lose all of its water. As a matter of fact, according to the scientists here, there's about 100,000 times less water on Venus compared to planet Earth. And if this is actually confirmed by future studies, it also means that this is probably something that happens on a lot of different planets out there and might be a kind of a universal mechanism for many planets to lose water, unless they can find a way to protect themselves, kind of like, I guess, planet Earth. And so, for all we know, maybe these bicarbonate ions are responsible for most of the water loss on both Mars and Venus. But once again, a lot of these, at least for now, are just propositions and just assumptions. However, we are going to have actual studies and actual measurements really soon. And that's because we now have three confirmed missions going to Venus. Da Vinci and Veritas, the NASA missions we've discussed previously in the videos right there, and a newly announced Envision by ESA, that's going to be orbiting Venus for several years, investigating and scanning its surface, trying to figure out what's happening in the atmosphere, measuring the atmosphere directly, and basically studying everything about Venus we could never study before. But this is going to be happening in 2031, so we're probably going to know all of this maybe in 9 to 10 years. But intriguingly enough, very recently NASA has also accepted another potential proposition for a Venusian mission by Jeffrey Landis, a person who's actually been trying to plan something for two decades. An atmospheric exploration mission with a potential sample return, maybe using a balloon, some kind of an airplane, or something else entirely that's going to basically explore Venusian atmosphere directly and then return the samples by using some kind of a small rocket. But because this has now been accepted for phase one, it means that it will probably take a few years before an actual plan is proposed and before we know more about what's going to happen. But this one is unlikely to happen until possibly mid-2030s. Nevertheless, really cool stuff and definitely exciting times for scientists studying Venus. Lots of explanations, lots of propositions and lots of science. But I'm sure there will be more in the next few months. And if you'd like to learn more about previous discoveries from the last year, check out one of the videos in the description. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.